Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Canadian Meets the South, episode seven, I believe. Gods and Generals is the book I'm reviewing by Jeff Shara. If uh, you don't know Jeff Shara, his uh, father won the Pulitzer Prize for um, in fiction for his book, The Killer Angels. And after um, Michael Shara's death, like Jeff's father, um, it was adapted into a movie in 1993 called Gettysburg. And Jeff decided to make a, a prequel to it called Gods and Generals. And afterwards, there was a movie of the same name in 2003, using many of the same cast from Gettysburg. Now, I'll review The Killer Angels in uh, the next podcast. And then after that one, The Last Measure, which was never adapted um, into, into film, it was... Jeff Shara's sequel to The Killer Angels, and yeah, it completed the, what became the trilogy. Um, but um, this is a uh, at the beginning of the book, like before before the actual story starts. Um, Jeff talks about the the background and why he created the book and um, it's a uh, telling the uh, the war through the eyes of the the characters or the the generals who fought um in the war and this is obviously copying the style of his father, Michael Shara, in The Killer Angels. But uh, Gods and Generals obviously happens before the Battle of Gettysburg. And it follows four men, two Union, um, two Union soldiers and two Confederate soldiers. Uh, the two Confederates were Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. Back then, his, well, his his legal name was Thomas Jonathan uh, Jackson. He earns the title Stonewall after the first battle at Bull Run at the beginning of the war. Um, and the two Union men were Winfield Scott Hancock and Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Uh, and th uh, three, the three of them, the three of the four men, as in, I mean, excluding Chamberlain, had fought in the Mexican-American War. Um, and, uh, but the, the book starts in 1858, and, uh, it, uh, talks about um, how, okay, in around this time, like back when James Buchanan was the president, um, Winfield Scott Hancock was a, a captain and he was deployed to, to Los Angeles, California, to, to be the, the United States presence in California. Now that's, um, because, you know, after the Mexican-American War, they they took a lot. Um, the United States took a lot from Mexico. Um, the the book talked to, uh, said that it, the Mexican American War was the United States flexing its muscles on us on a on a smaller country, on a weaker country, and yeah, they took California from Mexico, and they had said that um, the people, at least in Los Angeles, didn't even when they were told that it. That there, that California was now 
under the United States, uh, they they acted like nothing happened, and well, that's to be expected because ca California is really far from Washington D.C., the capital, and like, um, I remember. No, this is not in the book. Um, uh, hearing um, Zachary Taylor in the carriage to his inauguration had told James K. Polk um, back in 1849 that uh, um, well, like speculating that they should why they should even have California like what's the point of having California when they're all the way on the west coast um, and Zachary Taylor you know fought in the Mexican American War there's no reference to him in this book for some reason. Um, there's mention, there's reference of Polk, but not of Zachary Taylor. The main guy, like I guess the lead general there at the like around this time, the general in chief was Winfield Scott, who was um really um old. Like by this time, he was aging. Um. And he, because he had fought in the War of eighteen twelve, he was pretty old by this time. Um, so Winfield, uh, let's but let's talk about Winfield Scott Hancock. He had he had said he these um, Winfield Scott Hancock as well as Robert E. Lee and I think Stonewall Jackson had had you know been to West Point. Um, Winfield Scott Hancock was actually visited by Winfield Scott and asked his name. And he's like, okay, I'll do my best. Uh, Winfield Scott had said, I'll do my best not to embarrass you. And then you'll do your best not to embarrass me because you know, Winfield Scott Hancock was named after Winfield Scott. And from that perspective, from looking at Winfield Scott Hancock's perspective, his best friend was um, Louis Armistead. I... Since I, I I listened to them to the audiobook, I'm not sure how it's spelled. Um, or Louis Armistead, but Armistead was his best friend, and he was from Virginia, and I believe Winfield Scott Hancock. Uh, I'm I, he's a Northerner, let's say, and when they're both deployed in in California. And same thing with General Albert Sidney Johnston, who's from Texas. And they had met before going, the three of them met before going off to war. And um, Armistead was, was, you know, was close with both Hancock and Hancock's wife. And Hancock had said, oh, okay. Armistead said, "Oh, I I hope that Virginia doesn't se secede." Um, and then, um, okay, this is around eighteen sixty one. And toward oh, like, um, and Hancock says, "Does it matter? You swore and uh, with your home is the United States." Well, because. Armistead had said his home's Virginia, and he's and Armistead said I can't fight against my own people, which is actually what Robert E. Lee was. Will do. I'll talk about Lee later, but you will see the divide between him and between Armistead and Hancock, and then this old they'll the the last time we'll, they'll meet is in the Battle of Gettysburg, which is you know in the Killer Angels, after which takes place after this novel. Um. And what I found interesting was there's this fellow in California named Hamilton, who was a newspaper man, and he said, the people of California don't really know what government is. All they do is listen to the priests. There's this one woman, she's in her 60s or 70s, and all she does is listen to the priests of the Catholic Church. And... um. Yeah, they, and Hamilton said, when you go in and fight in the 
the war, the civil war, they're or against the rebels, um, they'll always uh, the 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 people of California will pull up, will put the, pull down the, the United States flag and put up the the Bear Republic flag, you know, California's flag. I found that pretty interesting, because um, even today there are California secessionists. Um, but, um, I'll talk about Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He was, he's from Maine, so he's also a, a, a northerner, like Hancock. And he, he also has a wife and a young family. And he was a professor at, at a university and, but he was, he was he was angering the other professors by telling, by encouraging his students to, to enlist in the, in the war against the South. And yeah, he was the governor of Maine, put him into, made him like a lieutenant colonel. Originally he was supposed to, be, he initially wanted him to be the colonel, but he, but God, Chamberlain didn't really have that much experience. And then, of course, his brother, Tom, I think his name was, is also in that regiment. I'm All these military terms, um, sometimes I don't know what they mean. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not a, a military man. Uh, and, yeah, he, um, the... The perspective of Hancock and Chamberlain's, um, and Chamberlain, they, they have the nationalist perspective. Although I don't believe either of them are Republicans. Um, Hancock. It said Hancock was a Democrat because his father was a Democrat, and in eighteen eighty, he was the Democratic nominee, presidential nominee, against. Um. Oh God, James Garfield. Um, in eighteen eighty. Um. You know the the guy who got assassinated, before like, before the uh, he even had a year in his presidential term. So, they had a nationalist perspective. Even even th they're not even Republicans. And they have the this nationalist perspective, and in contrast, um, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson have the state, uh, like the state, like loyalty to Virginia, loyalty to their state. In uh, for I'll talk about Stonewall Jackson first before Robert E. Lee. Um, Jackson, you know, the, the most famous man who served under Robert E. Lee. In, because Robert E. Lee was the commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, although not not at the very beginning. Robert E. Lee was first, first um, the first uh, the the military advisor to to President Jefferson Davis, and then they would have a couple of of um. Oh, I'm losing my words here. They would have a couple of meetings together with uh, the Secretary of War, General George W. Randolph, um, in the in the novel, but Stonewall Jackson was the most famous man under Robert E. Lee, and but before he came to fame, like yeah, he was he he went to West Point, I think he. He, he, after the Mexican American War, okay, he, he had, he was promoted three times all the way to major. I think he started the Mexican American War as a lieutenant, and then he was promoted to major, and then of course afterwards in the Confederate Army he was a a general. But uh, Stonewall Jackson is a. Uh, it doesn't really talk about the uh, the novel doesn't really talk about the slaves that he owned, 
but he did educate slaves to, to read and write. He had a Sunday school for them and wanted them to you know, read the Bible. Which, I mean, teaching slaves to read was illegal back in Virginia. So he could have been arrested. And there's, I've, I've read that there's one, there's one, uh, there was this one reverend back in like 1907, his, his parents were educated by um, Stonewall Jackson. And so he dedicated a monument to to him. So like this is, I guess, an, an African American. Like I don't really like using um, that hyphenated term, but um, it's an African American monument to Stonewall Jackson, like um, at, at like at a church. Um, and yeah, Stonewall Jackson. He he was known as a very devout Christian. Same thing with Robert E. Lee, but uh, Jackson it talked about talked about a little bit about how he spent time with some Span Spanish speaking people, Spanish priests, and he thought about converting to Catholicism, but he didn't really like the Pope. Um. So yeah, he was a Protestant. Same thing with Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Stonewall Jackson lived in you know what grew up in what was now what is now North, uh, West Virginia, and his. His uh, his uh, his sister was very close with him until until Virginia seceded. She was a staunch Unionist and abolitionist, and they were never on speaking. They never spoke to each other once the war had started. Um. Now. Uh, um, it talked about how Stonewall Jackson had um, two wives, and then his first wife died in childbirth, and the other, their baby died, and he, uh, his first father-in-law was uh, was a like the president of a of a university, and then his father-in-law was pro-union, so but he had to move out of. Well, I guess his former father-in-law was pro-union and moved out of the north, and then he he was really angry at Stonewall, like well, with Jackson at that, like when they departed. And his his daughter, his I guess his former sister-in-law said, oh, "Don't he doesn't really mean that. Like he's just angry because they've taken everything from him." But um, his second wife, they're. He had a second wife, and his first daughter died at five years old. And then his second daughter outlived him, like, like after the war. Like, she was a baby when he died in 1863. Um, and he died to the 18th North, North Carolina, um, as in died to friendly fire. And people, like, this was... A devastating blow to Robert E. Lee. He had felt that he had lost his right hand. Because Stonewall Jackson was the most talented man under Robert E. Lee. Um, and I'm I've I've heard, uh, at least I've read that people study Stonewall Jackson like military people like and the Battle of Bull Run, the first Battle of Bull Run, where he got his name, as well as some some other. There were some other battles that he did. Um, and what else was I going to say? Okay, before I go to Robert E. Lee, um, we, um, in, when, um, Winfield Scott Hancock had, like, joined the army and he was promoted, he was, pro he was also, yeah, promoted to general, just like, just like, uh, Lee, Lee was a lieutenant colonel. And and um, Stonewall Jackson. So uh, Hancock meets um, George McClellan, who he had he had heard of as a as an officer in in um, in the Mexican American War, and they were in and they both went to West Point, and but I think they were in different years, and. 
McClellan talked about how Winfield Scott was um was was really old, so he was going to leave on his own terms. But I want I'm not really too sure why he why Winfield Scott wasn't really like Winfield Scott was pro union, so, um even though he was a Virginian. But anyways, um, Scott, um, he had he had said that. Well, what I found from both the Union and Confederate side, but uh, let's just use McClellan, McClellan, as an example. He he talked about how the since the war started, the like the politicians, like especially like the president, they are appointing they're be they're being politicians. They're just appointing their friends who've never fought in the war. So, um, Hancock said, are you sure you want to uh, promote me to general? And then McClellan said, yeah, you actually were in the Mexican American war. You have experience. And this is what none of, this is what most of these other generals who were appointed by their political friends have, have, don't have that you have. And there was, yeah, both sides had a, had a, I guess they kind of hated politicians. They, there was this contempt for politicians because they're interested in, politicians are interested in giving their friends privileges while not really, while the soldier, the typical soldier is interested in fighting for his country. Um, I remember, yeah, Armis, Armistead, Armistead was going, it was already known, like back in California, it was known by like some of the some of his subordinates that he was going to resign from the United States Army because um, he was going to f- be on Virginia side. And one man, they they were fighting. There was a, there was a fight between two of his subordinates, and then the man uh, like over over this, and then kind of. And the man who who was loyal to the Union had said to Armistead that this is uh that this was unacceptable and that he he expected something better from an officer. And Armistead had realized I've taken something from this man that I can never give back. Because the 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 front like the the, the low the rank and file soldier, many of them yeah, they they were just interested in fighting for their country. That's it. So McClellan, who like I guess another theme is that Lincoln keeps replacing the generals after their fa- after their failures. And McClellan was was uh, one of them, and he later runs against Lincoln in the eighteen sixty four election and loses to <laughs> to voter fraud. It was a really close election, but. Um, uh, then you would see that with McClellan, like he, he, he was fighting for his country. The, the union side would always call, call the, the Confederates, the, the rebels because they were in rebellion, right? While the Confederates would call, would call the, the Northerners, you know, the Yankees or, or the, the Federals because they were considered federal troops. Um, now. Let's talk about, lastly, Robert E. Lee. So, um, you know, in the 1850s, um, he, um, 1858, his, uh, his father-in-law, who was uh, uh, Custis, who was uh, the, the son, like the adopted son of George Washington and the, the grandson of Martha Washington. So like George Washington didn't have any biological children. Like uh, Custis was his was his adopted son. So you would see this, you know, allusion to like he would think Robert E. Lee like saw, saw George Washington's statue in Virginia, and he said, "Oh, what would George Washington do?" He he was thinking. Um, but in eighteen fifty eight, when George when James Buchanan was the president. Um, he uh, he was um, the uh, 
Custis Washington dies. So he gives Rob, but in Robert E. Lee's will, he is not in Washington's um thing. Um, well, Washington's will, he gives the responsibility for executing his uh, his will to Robert E. Lee. So Robert E. Lee, no, and that includes free, freeing the slaves within five years. Robert E. Lee, it was, was a tough decision because it talked about how Washington's estate, Arlington, was was in debt, and then um, it would be it would be hard to to free the slaves because where would he send them? Or if he and like many of them couldn't be couldn't work for themselves um, because like of like disabilities or something that they become reliant on their master, right? And one of the one of the former slaves. He was, um, he was a free slave. He was a free man before, before Washington had died, and he had, like, he he had um. He was sent to Pennsylvania to to work, and he, I don't even remember his name unfortunately, but he he went to Robert E. Lee and, and said, "Can I, purchase my my brother's freedom?" And then, he said, "Oh, you can have your brother for free." But just make sure you can take care take care of him and then he said yes I will and the my my boss like the like the the guy um like the, the former slave's boss said it's okay to have his brother with him and they talked about Liberia about blacks going to you know freed slaves going to Africa this was like the idea of colonization where you would send the people Many of the abolitionists believed that they should go to, that the freed slaves should go to Liberia. They didn't believe that they could be equals with the white man in society. And yeah, Robert E. Lee had discussed with the former slave his uh, that he believed in em emancipation, but on God's terms. And then the, the former like but and like eventual emancipation, and the the former slave slaves, yeah. Um, but you know, well, no, the former slave was more skeptical and said, "Uh, some of these slave owners don't believe in God." Um. So, but he, I I don't know, Robert E. Lee. Yeah, did he? He gets portrayed in the media like this, you know, like slave owner like people cheered when his statue in richmond was taken down and cut in half barbarians <laughs> like this is what barbarians do they take down statues like this you know like in afghanistan the taliban have um have used the buddhist statues there as target practice like it's kind of it's it's a similar thing here they they take down confederate statues of robert e lee and the, the the mayor of Richmond and the governor of Virginia, they they really hate Robert E. Lee. I saw, um, like I think a tweet by the governor of, of Virginia, Ralph Northam. <laughs> he um he really hates Confederate statues, and then he talked. He said that what Robert E. Lee did was, uh, like participate in an insurrection. And, um, yeah, you know, what Robert Lee, E. Lee was doing, like, what do you think, what do you think George Washington was doing? Um, what do you think George Washington was fighting for? Like when, when Virginia declared her independence in 1776, well, duh, George Washington, George Washington had, um, had sworn an oath to, um, the British king. George the third and then yeah I guess he broke his oath but and the thing is I'm I'm thinking of Hancock he Hancock had said to like, his subordinates um you all swore an oath to the United States um the United States is your home well George Washington also swore an oath to the king and then he fought against the king I mean George the third actually did admire 
uh, George Washington. Um, it was obviously mostly the the British Parliament that was ta- It was the British Parliament that was really responsible for the the taxation without representation. Um, but in eighteen fifty nine, you would get Harper's Ferry, right? Um, and the the um fighting John Brown at Harper's Ferry. Listen, that's what that's what Robert E. Lee did. Um, what's his name? James Buchanan had deployed Robert E. Lee. Um, Buchanan was told by Scott that that Robert E. Lee was the best man for the job to to put down the slave insurrection at Harper's Ferry, which he which he did. And then Stonewall Jackson, who later was um, was used was like he was in command of guarding the execution of John Brown there like because John Brown was like the leader of the slave insurrection and yeah he was executed and what I found interesting about that was um being you know the devout Christian that he was uh Jackson was surprised that so many people like at like his execution were telling were telling John Brown to go to hell and not wishing not praying for his instead of praying for his soul's salvation but um going back to Lee um yeah that was I think that's why some people don't like him cuz they use people will use his um thing as the hybrid is uh, put, putting down a John Brown and Harper's Ferry to justify that he is a pro-slavery man or something. I don't know. He he was he was just putting down an insurrection in in um the in the United States, and he's Robert E. Lee's called a traitor. But as you know, um, Article Three, Section Three, uh, treason. Is only defined as war against the United States or giving aid and comfort to her enemies. No, to, to their enemies. Sorry. So their, as in, it's in plural. So it's not the central government. It is the states. Wage, wage of war against the states. Um, and at first... Okay, when at the when the when um the first seven states seceded, so that's that's first South Carolina and then all the other ones Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, um Georgia, Texas. Robin really actually talks with the with uh with Sam Houston and I think Sam Houston didn't like wasn't exactly thrilled with with how um, the secession went on, because I think when Texans got their independence in, when Texas had their independence in like 1836, uh, I'm, I'm fuzzy on the numbers, sorry. Um, it, I think it was through a referendum. A convention, like, which is what they had when they seceded from the United States. Um, and a convention is more of an American thing, but before they were even part of the United States of America. The uh Texas was Texas was an, got uh, I think became an independent republic from a referendum. And there was there was a guy from on Tom Woods' show like recently, like maybe a month ago, talk who talk who's been a Texan secessionist since nineteen ninety six. And yeah, he yeah, he talked about this on Tom Woods' show. I don't remember the the show it no the show number, but um uh, Sam Houston was in it and um, was in the novel Gods and Generals and and uh, talked a little bit with him with and yeah because there was secessionist um, yeah because Texas Texas eventually seceded and then the general in command there like because you know Robert Lee back then was a lieutenant colonel and the general commanding him like had already escaped and I think he lost Later lost his position as a general in the Union Army, um, and then 
the the military guy in charge of him said said to Robert E. Lee, "You are now the property of Texas." And then he said, "You can, but we will make you leave." Because back then Robert E. Lee was was a Union man, and he was Virginia hadn't seceded. So then Winfield he goes to Winfield Scott's, um, and Winfield Scott, and then later the the Secretary of War under Abraham Lincoln had okay first. How, how do I say this? Winfield Scott offers him the position of second in command of the army. And then afterwards, the, um, and then, okay, he, Robert E. Lee says, I'll think about it. And then the secretary of war under Abraham Lincoln offers him, yeah, the, the position of commander general. And yeah, Winfield Scott will, will leave the office as he, as when, as he, on his own terms, but he's, he's in theory, the head general, but Robert E. Lee will be the one commanding the Union Army. And he declines. And then he goes, Robert E. Lee declines because, because he did. After this, when, after the attack on Fort Sumter, like actually Winfield Scott had told Robert E. Lee he, that Lincoln was going to bait the South Carolinians to, to attack Fort Sumter. And like, although no one died, like Abraham Lincoln called for seventy five thousand troops, and then by then, it's too, by then that was irreversible. And but at this, um, Robert E. Lee said, um, Robert E. Lee declined because he didn't want to fight the the war. Like Virginia hadn't hadn't officially joined the Confederate States, but went at the at the very time he declined. Is uh the the position from the Secretary of War, Lincoln Secretary of War, and then Robert E. Lee. Uh. Oh man, I'm blanking out here. And yeah, Rob Robert E. Lee resigns his position as from the Union Army, and Winfield Scott says, "I expected this, and I'm disappointed." And they yeah they never spoke again. Uh. Because Winfield Scott had high, saw saw um, him as a in a high place, like so thought highly of Robert E. Lee. And was sorely disappointed when he decided not to not to end his career. Basically, Winfield Scott said Robert E. Lee was going to end, was ending his career, and he yeah uh, he he acquaints himself with the the governor of Virginia and eventually President Jefferson Davis. And the governor of Virginia said, yeah, I didn't, we didn't want to, to secede. But now that Lincoln's called the troops, yeah, I, even I wanted to secede. He told Robert E. Lee and then he, he said, so you are the man to, to defend Virginia, correct? And then Robert E. Lee said, yes. And then the governor said, or maybe it was some guy from the city council. He said, um... He said, "Hit them hard," and yeah, Virginia was where most of the where most of the thing took place. And and eventually, you know, the the war goes on. And these are like the bad. This is the up to like the the novel keeps going on about these de different details of the war, which. I, I wish I could explain further. I, I did not watch Getty's... Uh, oh, sorry, not... I didn't watch the movie Gods and Generals. Um, this is, you know, a book review podcast, but what I can say is um, is, um Stonewall Jackson's life ends. Like, you know, the doctor... The doctor couldn't save him. Like, and the doctor amputated his arm too, but... He, uh, uh, Stonewall Jackson dies, and then his wife, I don't know, his wife starts disbelieving in God or something, like, like the pastors, like one of the priests were tell, or, yeah, the past, the pastor, uh, one pastor was, was, the, the chaplain of the army was, of the, was saying, um, uh, like, pray to God for salvation. I hope he will give you salvation. And he said, how can I do that? 
um like my my child is fatherless now and yeah um his child dies at 26 leaving two kids but like they're 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 uh stonewall jackson's li line lives uh, lives on and his his wife is like second wife lives until 1915 and yeah had met theodore roosevelt and and william howard taft and theodore roosevelt i remember reading a quote how he was honored to shake uh, he told stonewall jackson's widow he was honored to to shake her hand because uh, she, she was like the, the first daughter of the confederacy I and mean, the first lady of the confederacy after jefferson davis's wife had you know, widow had died in 1906 um but yeah she lived a long time after like she she so she died in 1915 and her husband died 1863 she died she she was a widow for 52 years about and that just that's a very lonely time but confederate and like i think union soldiers also like all over the country after the war they all they all love to visit her to pay homage to, to stonewall jackson and his reputation and some of them would say i served under stonewall jackson in the stonewall regiment um but robert e lee said that he had he had he had lost his right arm like if stonewall jackson had his left arm amputated then stonewall jackson had lost his right arm he was to to robert e lee stonewall jackson was the most talented man he who had served under him and um so okay i'll give my my thoughts as a canadian who who sees this war some I don't know. Um, I didn't really look at to see Judah Benjamin, who you know. I think I've mentioned this before, but he he escaped the United States into England and then became a barrister there, and then he participated in um some cases of the in the judicial committee of the Privy Council, which was back then higher than the Supreme Court of Canada, and well, which and this court. And like he was, he involved himself in several cases between the uh, the provinces and the federal government back then, called the Dominion go government. And yeah, I think what I read online a little bit was that Stonewall Jackson didn't like Judah Benjamin at all. Judah Benjamin was one time the the Secretary of War. Uh, he he ended like his he was he served three positions under Jefferson Davis. He was Jefferson Davis's right hand man. Uh, the third position was Attorney General, but I think before that he was Secretary of State and Secretary of War. But um, he didn't even have any experience in war. He was never he wasn't a soldier, so I think people didn't like that when he when he was the Secretary of War. Like, for example, like, Jefferson Davis was, had no experience in war, but, well, he did have experience in war. He, he fought in the Mexican-American War, and he served under um, Franklin Pierce as the Secretary of War. I can't say the same thing about Calhoun, who had served under Monroe in the, as the Secretary of War, but... I'm sure, like this is this fed into the anti-Semitism at the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm just mentioning Benjamin because he he was you know of decent importance in Canadian history, early Canadian history. Um. Well, yeah, there's not much reference to Canada. I guess Jefferson Davis was hoping for the British to to help the Confederates in the war because they believe that. Because he believed that the the British was overly dependent on cotton, but you know, I think they got more cotton from from like Egypt or some other place when the when the war started. Um, but yeah, I well, I guess the first thing that pops into my head now is um is that people are taking down statues of people like John A. McDonald 
and like and others who had served under him like and there was this other there was this minister under mcdonald who had uh who was responsible for implementing residential schools and yeah, there now there's a lot of cancel culture in Canada around the residential schools and all the politicians who participated in them because the residential schools um, system ended in 1996, and yes, yeah, a lot of a lot of children died or were abused in the residential schools, and True Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, he he's saying some like bad things i guess about the catholic church and even though he like he's catholic and also his his father was a devout catholic as well and he his father also like sent children to residential schools so he i, I don't know he, like he shouldn't be too crit <laughs> he should if he doesn't look good on him saying that stuff about residential schools and how he wants to sue the catholic church or something um, but the same cancel culture of like tearing down statues for residential schools, this, this stuff is happening in the United States. I'm sure like my listeners would know this, like from the United States, they're tearing down, um, Confederate monuments, um, because, you know, slavery, even though we know that with that, with that type of logic, um, the founders are next, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and even the guys in between, like John C. Calhoun, John Tyler. Um all of, like there's two to these woke uh like communists or like Antifa type of people, they they just they wanna tear down everything. And like, I don't know, like, maybe start from 2009, like, maybe start history from 2009, when the first, first, um, black man became president of the United States. I don't know. Um, like, this cancel culture thing, this is, it's crazy. These, these communists really want to remake society, and because... They're not perfect, like because, and like take away people's history because like take away like destroy statues and renaming um institutions because um because they were named after someone who implemented residential schools or in Canada or owned slaves in the United States, like this. This isn't. It's not right. And yeah, I, I mentioned yeah, Teddy Roosevelt. At my uh, loved um, Stonewall Jackson's widow, Eisenhower, and Franklin Roosevelt loved um, love Robert E. Lee, um, and Eisenhower had said that at this at the time that at the time Robert E. Lee was fighting, which is um. He, it was not clear. It was not a clear. There was no no clear answer to the question of whether a state could secede or not. And there's this famous quote by Franklin Roosevelt about how Robert E. Lee was was one of the most uh, our most great American Christians. Um. So I don't know what why uh, what to say. Like why. These people, these these far leftists, they want to just tear everything down. They want everyone who's not perfect. Like it goes for for the United States, and like they'll they'll go all the way. They'll tear. They'll cancel everyone until George W. Bush, and like cause, you know George W. Bush, like if maybe he wasn't racist, but he was friends with racists or something. Like he's he's born in nineteen forty five, George W. Bush. Of course he he had he had some white supremacist friends. Like who and same thing with Bill Clinton, like who didn't? Who didn't? 
who was born in the 40s who who didn't like you know what i mean like no one's no one's perfect like except maybe like they'll cancel every single president president before obama except maybe john quincy adams because john quincy adams was an abolitionist <laughs> they'll cancel they'll cancel john quincy adams father john adams because he wasn't anti-slavery enough <laughs> and he did nothing oh uh, uh, so i don't know these these people they and then the people who who were in favor of some of these people who are, who are maybe not communists they say sl- treason treason the uh, the guys who these confederates are traitors why do we celebrate traitors and uh I mean, because they know some of these people they know that if they if they use the word slavery then the founders are next but i'm like they're gonna take these communists are gonna take down the founders anyways like why why are you even for tearing down any of these statues like treason like are you like are you serious what do you think george washington was doing what do you think john adams thomas jefferson james madison james monroe john quincy adams and andrew jackson were doing in 1776 to 1783 or okay 1775 to 1783 like that's the period of the war what do you think they were doing were they not committing treason against the british against great britain like you know um i don't know like it just it's just wrong that these people are taking down statues of these men they were they were fighting for their land for their states each of them were fighting for their states because the confederates like if you've read the confederate constitution the the permanent constitution it says we the people of the confederate states which with each state acting in its own sovereign capacity so each state like the people they the 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 confederate constitution was created with the mentality of how they understood the united states constitution so it was built on the, the Confederate States was obviously built on the principle of federalism. That's why it's called Confederate. They believed in states' rights. They were so they were these these men. They were fighting. The majority of them were fighting for for their state, for the independence of their state. Because if you had asked any poor soldier who was too too poor to own any slaves, the average soldier, he, you if you ask him why is he fighting, they'll say the Yankees are here. They're being invaded. They were being invaded in 1861. That's why they fought. They fought for their state. Like this idea, they fought for slavery. Yeah, some of them did. Majority of them, like, majority of them didn't have slaves. They're fighting because they were being invaded. Yeah, most of the politicians had slaves, or virtually all of them. Um, But the average soldier was fighting for his th- for his thing for his state well except i guess the ones who were conscripted both sides had conscription but so i'm i'm not gonna it was it's 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 not good i don't i'm not gonna i'm not gonna defend jefferson davis for doing that like i talked about this in in my podcasts one of my podcasts on the rise and fall of the confederate government um but i'm not i don't want to defend jefferson davis for that but but for the most part, these guys didn't, most of the Confederate soldiers didn't have slaves. And if you had asked the un- many of the Union men before the Emancip- Emancipation Pro- Proclamation, they would say, we're fighting to put down these rebels. We're fighting to keep the Union. It's not slavery. It's as in slavery is, when I'm saying it's not slavery, I'm like, people think it's, all about slavery slavery is the number one reason and it's the it's the majority of the reason it's like no it's not and virginia as well as arkansas tennessee and north carolina they only seceded because lincoln called for seventy five thousand troops to invade this the confederate states that's 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 why they seceded um it wasn't slavery okay so um i think that's enough for today's podcast 
thanks for listening, everyone. Um, so I'll be talking more about about uh, the the trilogy of the Killer Angels. Next up, ep- next episode will be the Killer Angels, and then the following in- episode will be the Last Measure. So please look forward to those episodes. Thank you.